All right. Good morning. And welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. Today, this is your host, Bruce. Well, I'm going to just introduce myself first because I'm messing it up here. Rachel Marshall and Bruce Weiner. I almost mixed up our last names, Bruce. And today we are on episode, you know, 26, I think, of Becoming Your Own Banker. And this is a long series that we've been going through, Bruce. I was having second thoughts about maybe we should break this into multiple episodes and it might turn into that. But today we're talking about the top money myths and we are at the very back of this book by Nelson Nash. And what we want to do today is talk about the top seven lies that are probably costing you money. Now, Nelson Nash doesn't lay out these these ideas in the terms of what the problem is or the myth. However, he says points to consider. And I would argue that this is probably one of the most valuable sections of this book because what he's talking about is what is truth in seven different different areas of money. The problem is most people don't walk around believing and understanding the truth that he lays out. And instead, they're under the delusion or the lie or the myth that is commonly perpetrated and perpetuated in our society about money. And they're costing you. They're costing you mentally, they're costing you emotionally, and they're costing you financially. And so today we're going to talk about those seven myths. So bear with us today. If you are joining, please go ahead and give us a wave in the chat. Go ahead and tell us where you're listening from and what you think is the top money myth. I would love to hear your idea of what you think is the top money myth. Bruce, I would love to hear your thoughts as we jump into this fascinating section of the book. Well, I think uh, I think you, <clears throat> you know this, but I don't think the listeners know this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is Nelson's book, but this section was actually added by David Stearns, his son-in-law. I didn't. And, uh, oh, and um, what's interesting is this is the fifth edition. And after David basically worked with Nelson for a decade or so, he said to Nelson, you know, these questions keep coming up by people and they're not really getting what you're saying. So why don't we add why don't we add a section in the book that actually would be a great reference point for people to go back to when they start thinking differently than they should be thinking or as Nelson would say rethink your thinking. So yeah this is a, a actually attributed this section is attributed by um to David Stearns and of course you know he learned everything from Nelson. So um, you know, this truly is um, Nelson agreeing to put this in his in his book. So a couple of things, um, Bruce, as you mentioned that one, it sounds like Nelson was still alive when it was added to the book. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. OK. So the second thing is you said rethink your thinking. And that's literally what I wrote above points to consider. And this is something that Nelson Nash talked about all the time. It's one of his I mean, Bruce, you say it better than I do. One of his five rules. Is that what they're called? Rules of. Money. Rules I would say tenants. Bank. Tenants. Okay. Tenants. Of infinite banking. Yeah. So rethinking your thinking, but nobody kind of just walks around in life saying, hey, let me please rethink my thinking. I mean, that's not really what we're usually seeking to do. However, the problem is that if we don't rethink our thinking, we will get stuck in negative thought patterns and we'll get stuck in ways of conceptualizing the world and ourselves and money and relationships and everything about the world that is self-defeating the opposite of self um the, the opposite of serving the opposite of what is good for you and so i really was thinking deeply about this section of the book as i was preparing and really what i wanted to bring to the forefront was that these truths that are laid out really um are the fundamental components of everything that we've covered so far in the book. And it is a very quick summary. And he says, here's what to think. But the problem is most people aren't thinking this way. Most people are believing the converse or the inverse. I, they're both opposite in some way of logic. Um, but most of us are believing the opposite to be true. And Nelson 
um, courtesy of David Stearns, his son-in-law, putting these in the book really helps us to put our mind on the straight and narrow and really think about how to think properly about money. So yes. I do not see yeah. the chat, um, Bruce. I know we're live, but I'm not seeing anything. Oh yeah, in the I'm chat, I'm, so. yeah, I'm responding to some people. I'm going to go ahead and log out of that and just bring that back up and hopefully I will see it. So if you're commenting, um, I will hopefully see your comments shortly. So Bruce, let's go ahead and jump in. I What I love about this is he did number this one through seven. And so I'm going to state what I believe is the best way to articulate the myth that most people believe. And then we're going to really unpack what these points to consider are so that we can think properly about money. So the first is that you need two incomes to have a household income or you need two incomes to support a family. And this is a tricky one and really challenging because there are so many factors that are leading towards needing more income in a household. And just to name a few, our cost of inflation has gone up com compared to wages. We also have an affluent lifestyle and things that we begin to expect with um, something called Parkinson's law that Nelson laid out earlier. And so the level of what we say is our need in a typical household is higher than what we actually need. So our desire for consumption and, um, and living at a certain standard of living is higher than a need. It's something that is artificially added to. But in addition, what happens here is that often this is something that, and I'm going to just talk about something we don't discuss on this show very often. And it's the idea that if we separate the family from the multi-generational web or network or tribe, then we just have a nuclear unit. We have mom, dad, and some kids. What happens is that when you're living just as a nuclear family only, you don't have that support network of childcare and asking questions of the previous generations. You don't have that, that camaraderie and that collaboration that usually did in the past happen across generations. And so you have to go hire out all of these services like schooling and childcare and all of these things that used to be handled within the home, but not just the nuclear family. They handled, they were handled within the corporate or the multi-generational family. So when you have all of these societal factors going towards smaller and smaller family units, then we think, well, how am I going to pay for the child care that I need and all the schooling that I need? And how am I going to pay for the things that are in our modern society set as needs? Well, now we have to have two incomes to support that. And so usually then you have mom working, dad working, both out of the home. And what Nelson is saying is there's just another way to think about this, or I guess I should say what David Stearns is saying. There's a different way to think about it. And it's not going to be uh, perfectly black and white. It's not like there's one right way to do things, but he just encourages us to think about there are two different sources of income, people at work and money at work. And often we just go to the quickest path, which is people at work. I have to go earn a higher income. I have to have more dollars coming in from my job. And that is the limitation of our thinking that the only place that our, um, that our financial system is growing is from income from a job, which then we say, I need higher income and I need more incomes to support the household. Yeah, this is, um, <clears throat> this is an interesting topic. Um, and I'm not sure, um, David kind of, or uh, Nelson who approved it being in his book, um, really clarified money at work. So, you know, this is a basic economic, uh, thing that is money is created through work and you know they're trying to say money at work but remember money at work is also being produced by people at work or people that had already done work so example would be um, having real estate investment somebody had to build that particular real piece of real estate that mm -hmm. was work somebody had to you know make all the components for that real estate that was work um, if you're running it out, there has to be cleaning, maintaining that is work. So even in passive income, they're, they are a result of work. So one of the passive incomes my wife and I enjoy are um, 
oil and gas partnerships that we get monthly checks from and that there's work on those oil and gas rigs. Mm -hmm. And so that is work. Um, but you know, the other thing that I talked about, you might not personally be doing work, but somebody is doing work to create this asset. Correct. And then, um, you know, I talked to Nelson about this before, and you and I have mentioned this before. We don't let, really like the word passive income mm -hmm. because, well, first of all, we had to actually, we had, had to actually work to get the money to put what people consider passive income. So people in those oil and gas partnerships would consider that passive income um, because you're not doing anything right now for it, but you did something uh, earlier for it. And you really need to monitor it also, you know, going forward, not only for the, the, any future partnerships you want to get into, but the tax ramifications, so on and so forth. I mean, there's all kinds of work that's being done in that situation. But I would yeah. say that um, I also talked to Nelson about this idea that you need <clears throat> two families or two people in the family with income. And he, he kind of disagreed with me. Of course, Nelson was wonderful. He always listened to everybody's opinion. And, you know, I made the point that when Nel when Nixon took us, took us off the gold standard and tr caused tremendous inflation throughout the 70s, um, and then that just has carried on throughout the 80s and 90s, and, you know, we're in massive, uh, coming out of massive recession right now in the 2024, um, that caused a lot of problems within the, the nuclear family to actually stay up with it. Now, Nelson's point was, is that, well, Bruce, if they would eliminate the 34.5% that's flowing out for financing, then that would more than overcome the amount of inflation that they're, mm. that they're having. And, you know, that was, that's a very good point. It's a very, very good point. But now in, I would say since 2000, we've actually had what we called what I call, and I don't know if I made this up or if I heard it somewhere, I probably heard it somewhere, technological inflation. Mm -hmm. Technological inflation is things like that you have no control over if you want to run your household. For you and I right now, we're running our household uh, with the internet. Mm -hmm. And if we do not stay up with the internet uh, changes, then we will not have good internet to actually be able to broadcast. Uh, also with... Um, with our computer systems, with our audio or visual, those kind of things. We need that um, increased technology. And in some cases, you know, they, they phase out, they phase out a, even a simple phone that you're using. You know, some flip phones now cannot be used on certain networks. So there's technological inflation that comes in into this. So there's various reasons why I can see the pressures that, a modern family is is has for two incomes. The other reason that, and we, and I don't want to del uh, delve into this uh, a lot, but another reason why there's a feel of two incomes is, um, you know, as women were were feeling more confident and more jobs were opening, and they felt like they wanted to have a career on their own. Once again, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, they wanted to get into the workforce also and have a career. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then as we, we take that to an, another step forward, then it was uh, where women really should have a career, not they should choose to have a career. They mm -hmm. should have a career. And, and there's a couple of reasons. Elon Musk talks about this. <clears throat> he actually thinks we're underpopulated on the planet. And that it's a noble profession to have children. And we've taken that away from women. But he also says some of the brightest minds are from the, the uh, female population. So we should encourage them to get in the workforce to actually help society. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword uh, that's very, very complicated. You know, Bruce, and, it was funny and as so I that's was getting what, ready for this. I was thinking, oh, Bruce is not going to like if we just try to pack this into one episode each. I, there's so much to say about this and I don't want to cut you off, but there's um, so much that I'd like to respond to even what you just said before we move on. Was there something else? No, that'd be great. Go, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one thing that is really interesting about women 
in uh, in the workforce. I mean, if you just look at one side of it, I think, I guess my problem with the idea of women in the workforce, and I mean, you could say, well, I'm in the workforce in a way. Um, so I'm maybe speaking out of two sides of my mouth and, and we're, I'm working through some of these ideas and figuring out how it applies in our own personal life as well. But this idea that women should work, I think this stigma that it's better to be outside of the home because you're more valuable if you're bringing in a dollar income paycheck into the home rather than a stay-at-home mom. And I think, I mean, that argument, there's people on both sides of it. But what I would definitely say is there's so much value to investing in children, raising children, uh, nurturing the home, managing the home. There is so much work involved in that that I think so many people overlook and they say, oh, it's you're just a stay-at-home mom. And that is tremendously, I think, insulting to the person who is raising children and schooling them and educating them and, and helping them become mature and responsible human beings that are well-mannered. I mean, there's just so much involved in that. And so the that actually plays over into the idea of human life value, which we're not even discussing here. But often people say, well, if I'm not bringing in a paycheck that has dollars attached to it, that I don't qualify for life insurance because I don't have a dollar income. And the truth is the life insurance company looks at you, who is a, the person who's a stay-at-home mom, and says, you're bringing in a financial contribution and an economic value to the home because of your contribution. It is economically valuable to have the woman or somebody. I mean, I'm I'm coming from a Christian, Judeo-Christian perspective that it would typically be the woman that's staying in the home. But at the same time, there's just so much value to the work that is done in the home that is not less valuable than work that's done outside of the home. But what's even more important in this particular discussion is he's alluding to this. And later on, if you flip forward into the books that he recommends, he recommends Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is written by Robert Kiyosaki. And that book has something called the cash flow quadrant. This idea is also further expounded on in some of Rich, or Robert Kiyosaki's further works and further books as well. But the cash flow quadrant really shows that you can either be employed as an E, you can be self-employed, that's an S. Those are both on the left, I think, side of the quadrant, and I'm not even sure. They're on one side of the quadrant. And on the other side, you have business owners and investors, B and I. And what's really interesting is the distinction that he makes is that employees and self-employed people have, they're trading their time for money. So you're you're spending your time to get an income. And even say you're a, a mechanic, a chiropractor, a dentist, that you're trading your time for money. That's on the self-employed side. Then he distinguishes and differentiates that from the right side of the quadrant that is business owners and investors. And he said the difference between being self-employed and being a business owner, this is Robert Kiyosaki again, is that as a business owner, you own an asset that you're not completely dependent on your time, meaning there are systems in place, there are people in place, there's a team that you are leaning on that is continuing to have this process and this business operate, whether or not you are showing up to work and trading those, those hours in. And then as an investor, you're thinking about owning assets. So wouldn't it, and I think this is maybe just a helpful question, wouldn't it be valuable to think about how we can shift from just trading time for money, which is people at work in David Stearns' language here inside of the book, to the idea of putting money to work, meaning thinking about asset ownership rather than just income. And that's not necessarily as clear of a distinction, Bruce, as you were just talking about passive income, and you do have to earn the money first if you're going to put it to work in assets. But let's just say, for instance, you had a focus to build assets, businesses, real estate, investments, things that were asset-based, that provided asset-based income. And if you had those assets that you could then hand down to your children and to your grandchildren, wouldn't it be possible that maybe not just in your lifetime, but in generations of your family's lifetime, that you could shift the whole family's trajectory from just focusing on people at work towards money at work. And so I think that's a powerful question that is something that my husband Lucas and I are continuing to lean into and explore this idea of how can we build assets that would then be something that can be generational assets, not just money at work.
and then David Stearns. I keep wanting to say Nelson Nash, but David Stearns is here. Well, either way, I mean Nelson page. Nelson approved it, so I mean yes. you can say it's it's in <laughs> Nelson's book. So right. the idea then that if instead of thinking about just getting two incomes, if we could think about, well, yes, you need income into a house, but how can we think about shifting towards an asset mindset to then have assets that are put to work? And he's saying life insurance is a powerful asset in that money at work. Yeah. So, um, you know, Kiyosaki says that the, that your house isn't an asset because it's not producing any income. And that's his definition of an asset, something that's producing income. Mm -hmm. That's an asset. Um, and this is a shifting of way you think, because what most people do <clears throat> in, and we're going to get into this uh, later on in this uh, part of the book, what most people do is they put money in places that the government has suggested. And in that case, that those monies are trying to work for you, producing appreciation, not income. And you know, some people would argue, but you could put it in dividend paying stocks and that's income. I guess you could, you could argue, argue that, but what Kiyosaki is saying and what um, Nelson is saying with David Stern is that really what you should be looking at is making your money work for you. And there's a ver variety of ways to do it. I, I mentioned one already. Um, an another one that I'm involved in is uh, private lending. And private lending is a great way to produce income. Also, I'm involved in non-traded REITs. And when you have a non-traded REIT, you are um, getting money just like you would on a syndication, for example, or from a rental property. I've chose to diverse myself from all the rental properties that I used to own um, because uh, to me, that was too much work. It wasn't really passive income because I had a I had to manage the management companies. I had to manage, in some cases, the renters. Uh, I had to rent, uh, manage the subcontractors that would come in, so on and so forth. And it was just, it wasn't passive income to me. Uh, they say it was nice tenants, termites, and toilets, which is the yeah. number one <laughs> right. uh, reason why most people getting into real estate, when they are also the property manager, they end up dealing with all those things that lead to right. not And there's tremendous, income. yeah. And there's tremendous tax benefits to doing that. And if I was a full-time professional, real estate professional, maybe it wouldn't seem as bad, but doing it part-time, I really wasn't that interested. And I'm getting the same type of results from the oil and natural gas partnerships. Now you have to be an accredited investor for those. And we can't talk about, you know, the specific on the, on the podcast. And then you can get into private equity also. But then Nelson's saying is, even before that, because you have to be an accredited investor in a lot of this stuff, not necessarily private lending or if you do a syndication on your own. Um, but he's saying is the, the best is actually funding a specially designed whole life insurance contract. And it's funny, our mastermind that I run every Tuesday morning, we were actually looking at this yesterday for a man who wanted to put $50,000 a year into a policy, more than comfortable for him. He was making $650,000 a year. And we were looking out, he was uh, 49 years old, and we were looking out at age 80, and that $50,000 would actually produce $150,000 plus of income tax-free for him at age 80. Per now, year, obviously, right? per year, per year, and growing. And growing. So, and how long was he putting the money in? in well, from before... forty-nine to eighty. Okay, so for thirty yeah. years. Yeah, and and he was a, he was an entrepreneur. He wasn't really looking to to actually retire, but we were. And that and the reason we went out to age eighty is he was kind of joking around and said, "Yeah, I guess I probably will have you know stop or at least slow down at 80. And we were looking at that power of the dividends plus the guaranteed interest producing $150,000 of tax free. And in his tax bracket, you know, he's at, he's at 37% at the upper tax bracket. Plus he was in a state that it was about 7% from the state taxes. So he was at 44%. So he's losing about half 
of the income at the top at the top brackets. So that money right there was probably he would have to make somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred and seventy five thousand mm-hmm. and then pay the taxes because remember we're stacking it on top of his entrepreneurial income because he said he just wanted to slow down. So you can see how um that particular what Nelson calls passive income from the the life insurance is very, very powerful when you can when you compare it to a taxable income. And that's what one of the things that Nelson just cannot stand about government sponsored 401ks, IRAs, you know, so on and so forth. So I wanted to give you that story to kind of lead into the section, you know, down down the road here as we talk about this. That's awesome. There's actually two sections that you're connecting into. So um, so let's just recap. The myth number one is that you just need more household income to run your household. And the truth of that is that we, it would benefit you. I'm not saying that you need to. It would benefit you to move from just thinking about how to get more dollars in income based on how much time you're working and increasing your hourly rate to moving over to thinking about asset-based income and especially using life insurance to produce the power of having so much available to you, but including income in the future. So the second um, myth would be that future taxes aren't a big deal. And I didn't even know how to title this one because I think so many times we just think I'm tax deferring, which means I'm free, hallelujah, from the taxes. And I'm in a position of saying, I don't pay tax on this money. When we think of deferring, that means we're pushing it out to the future, which means we don't really have to think about it right now. The problem with that thinking, it's like procrastination. When you procrastinate something, it's going to happen to you eventually. You're still going to have that assignment due. You're still going to have to handle that thing that you didn't think about for a while you're still going to have to pay taxes in the future. And the way that this section is laid out is that he says, if you, um, so David Stern says, if you knew at passive income time that you would be getting back everything that you paid into a system tax-free, would you object to putting more money into it? And so Bruce, this is exactly what you were just talking about. The idea that if you had to pay tax on money in the future, you would have to have far more money in the future in order to get the same financial results in the future. And we have to think about taxes. We have to think about what decisions we're making today that are going to improve our tomorrow tax situation. I think of it in this way. I can't even remember where I heard this. It might've been in um, the book, Atomic Habits. And um, I am not going to quote verbatim, but basically it was, you can have the pain now, the challenge now for the reward in the future, or you take the great thing now and you pay for it with pain in the future. I mean, it's, it's our health. It's the decisions we make with our time. You can do the hard thing now, or you can have the challenge in the future. I mean, Bruce, you say, pick your heart, which thing do you want? Do you want the good now, or do you want the good in the future? Do you want the pain now or the pain in the future? And so if you can handle the tax situation today, then you're in a position where the future self, when you arrive to that place on the monopoly board game of your life, and you are now stepping into the future you, you're going to look back and say, my goodness, I'm so thankful. I didn't just ignore the taxes that that future me was going to have to think about. Yeah. So let's, um, (laughs) I deal with this almost on a weekly basis and, you know, we, we have to preface this. I'm not saying that there's there's never a time when investing in the stock market and tax deferring does not come out better in the long run. I'm not saying that. There are, but I'm saying that you have to actually analyze it. And I've done this for the past, let's say since 2007, so 17 years. With my clients, I actually go over their current tax uh, situation using current tax rates. Okay, that's really important. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about income that they would like if they want to go into retirement. And remember, a lot of people want to get income in retirement and still work Mm part-time. Okay, I hear this all the time. 
this this phenomenon where people say, I just want to kind of retire, never do anything and lay on a beach and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't happen very often. Um, you know, if you wanted me to put a number to it, I might say 30 to 40 percent. Um, it's certainly, I think, below. People want to do something to produce income. And so and what Nelson ends up happening is that Nelson would agree yeah, well, that Nelson died. Nelson was working till he the day he died. Um, he talks about the what, retirement trap in this book. So yeah, he's in and, agreement. So you're actually stacking money on top of it. And then if you do a, a nice passive income, you're stacking money on, let's just say you you stop working, where you're stacking money on other income that you um, set aside or you deserve, such as Social Security income. So what's interesting is when you when you actually look at the marginal tax brackets, especially for people that are successful or going to be successful, whatever that whatever that means to you, success. Uh, I think one of the bad things we actually teach people, especially young people, when we say, hey, we want to teach these young people, is you need to tax defer as much money now for your retirement. However, when they do that, that's actually the beginning of their, their, their career. And at the beginning of their career, they're mar- they're in the lower marginal tax brackets. Mm-hmm. So now you might be saving money at 12%. You're locking that up at age 25 until 59 and a half, only to be more successful. And now you're taking it out at 24 or 32%. Does it really make sense to tax the it at 12% to take it out at 24 or 32%? I mean, absolutely not. It it doesn't make any sense, and you're and you're locking it up and putting it in a prison, and you're you're subject to the um, ups and downs of the stock market, and you do not have as much money then to actually eliminate the banks as far as financing, mm-hmm. because you're you're putting a portion of your gross income in tax deferment. So what you can do is you can actually do some project projections. And I've done this for my clients. I've probably done it 4,000 times. And you can actually look at the marginal tax brackets. Let's say they're, the marginal tax bracket is $120,000 in the 24%. In other words, there's a gap from 32 to 24 of $120,000. You're at the top of the 24% tax bracket right before the 32. Even if your income goes down in retirement, it'd have to go down $120,000 before you would save in taxes. And that's if the marginal tax brackets stay the same. And we're currently about $34 trillion in debt in the United States, backed by bonds that they, the only reason they could get those bonds is the taxing authority of the United States government to pay them back. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that eventually that is going to have to maybe not paid all the way back, but paid down, to stop it from growing. Mm -hmm. So this is the the test that would go up in the future to have more income from the government, which means tax rates or meaning tax rates would increase or the threshold. They, I mean, the government can change this too. They can change the threshold at which you have to pay those higher income or higher taxes. And so, yes, what you're saying is, we don't have a crystal ball to say taxes are going up in the future, but it makes perfect sense why they can do nothing but go up. So let me just wrap, let me just wrap that section up in my mind. The thing that you hear over and over and over again is you're going to be in a high tax bracket while you're working in a lower tax bracket when you retire. You hear that from equity companies and the United States government, and what are they getting out of it? Well, the the 401k equity companies are getting you to put money in at a very young age. That money is subjective to fees. If you take and, it out, yes. Well, no, there, there's trading fees within oh, yes. the, the stocks, okay? And they, they want you to do it early so that they can charge you those fees a long period of time, okay? The government wants you to do it. They're going to tax defer now. And they want it to grow so that they'll get more taxes in the end. And oh, by the way, they don't have to pay the fees. 
The government's not paying the fees. You're paying the fees on the taxes that you're actually paying from the tax deferred money. So the amount mm -hmm. of money that comes out, not only do you have to pay taxes on it, but you pay fees on that money the entire time. So what you're saying is you pay fees on 100% of the money, even though you only get to use a portion of it, the portion Correct. that didn't go to taxes. Correct. And pe that people never take this in consideration. So I've done this analysis thousands of times, and I'm going to admit there was probably a dozen or so times, it was a very small number, where people were going to be in a lower tax bracket. Okay. In the future. But that's if the that's if the marginal tax brackets don't change in the future also. Mm -hmm. And I think there's every indication that they could be changing. Absolutely. So the myth here for number two is that future taxes are not a big deal. The truth of the matter is you probably won't be in a lower tax tax bracket in the future. The government can change taxes. They can change the tax rates. They can change the tax thresholds. And you would be tremendously benefiting yourself to pay the tax today so that in the future, you have the ability to access and use that capital without having to pay taxes. Um, let's move into number three. And I have a feeling we're not going to cover all seven today. So number three, uh, Bruce, do you want to handle some of the comments in the chat before we move on? Is there anything that we want to address here? Thank you everyone for um, chiming That's in. That's funny. I was just, I online. was just replying to Fitz on, um, on here, but we can, we can do it orally. Uh, Fitz says, I think the Fed should be deciding on interest rates today. I wonder if interest rates will eventually get to a level when Nelson got into trouble. Might seem, uh, might be possible seeing the impact of the money supply. Um, Fitz, I, you know, this is what Nelson, this is what Nelson would say. Anything's possible with people associated with Washington. Now, some people might be screaming at the podcast right now and say, well, the, the Federal Reserve is not part of the federal government. And you're right, it's not. But they are highly influenced by uh, the president and by Congress. Um, and so could they get could they get as high, Fritz? Once again, <laughs> Congress uh, could put that influence. The 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 government the the uh, head of the our nation, the president, could put some pressure on. However, I think they're going to put the pressure on the other way for two reasons. One is if the interest rates go up too much, um, the federal debt will, will get even more out of control because we will be adding to it at an astronomical level. Two, in this year, it's actually an election cycle. So um, to at least hold the rates the way they are, I would, I would see that to be the maximum they would do. Could they um, compress them, bring them down? Yes. I believe they can bring them down a little bit. You are absolutely right, though. If they would let the free market decide on this, then I do believe that interest rates could go up, but they're not going to let the free market decide. <laughs> so that's why I believe they will stay the same or slightly compressed going forward. Bruce, I think that's just a powerful conversation that um, pulls together all the ideas of the Federal Reserve and Austrian economics and just so much um, so much there. Uh, there was a couple of comments earlier, and this was when I was asking about the top money myths. And Fritz, you said here, uh, money doesn't grow on trees. I think that is uh, a myth in a way because, well, it doesn't, it's not free for the taking. Like you can't just wake up and money is there. I'm, but you have the capability to produce money by providing value because dollars follow value. That's a financial principle. It's a principle that is always true. As you provide value, you have the ability for the reward or the receipt of that transaction to come back to you in the form of money. And we have infinite ability to create value for others and infinite people to create value for. And so there is a lot of opportunity. And then um, here, TC Chowdhury, um, thanks for jumping in and never enough money. Um, I don't know if that was the myth or the truth, but if we can think about that from an abundance perspective, there always is enough to 
do what we need to do. We just have to think differently about how to obtain it and then how to manage it and how to grow it effectively. Yeah. I don't know if TC meant this on uh, any, any may have, um, he may m- mean that if you're, if one person's getting rich, then mm-hmm. another person's getting poor. And that's a, that's, that is a really prevalent, um, mindset that people have. And, you know, it's been proven over and over. We've actually brought more people out of poverty over the last 50 years from increasing the wealth across, you know, the entire world. So uh, never enough money that he may just be saying from a family perspective, but he also may have meant that. Yes. So he could have been mentioning that as a myth or as a prevalent way of thinking, which the truth is it's not a finite pie. I love Garrett Gunderson, I think was the first person that brought up this idea, but money is not a finite pie. Meaning you, if you are improved, then I have to be um, shrunk down. I have to be taken from in order to improve you or improve someone else and vice versa. And that's just this idea of give and take, which is a scarcity mindset. And the truth of the matter is that as we improve As we give more value, we financially benefit, but the people that we gave the value to financially benefit as well because their life is improved. So yeah, it's it's also followed up with a no soft landing, wink, wink. Um, (laughs) You know, this is, this is interesting. Um, They're they're the so-called experts for the last 18 months have been, you know, wrong. (laughs) Because, um, you know, you can read things from Morgan Stanley, Raymond James, Wells Fargo, all these supposed uh, people that have economists on staff, and they were predicting, you know, recessionary situation, whatever the definition of recession is nowadays. I don't even know what the definition is. Um, And it hasn't happened. And, you know, people say, oh, look at the Fed. They're actually doing a really good job. There's going to be a soft landing whatever that means. There is an inverted um, yield curve with bonds, which has always um, preceded a recession. And Dr. Murphy talked about that before, Dr. Robert Murphy. And, but it's, that doesn't mean that we couldn't have a soft landing, but it doesn't mean that the Fed was the one who was able to orchestrate it. It could have been from a variety of other things, such, such as now we're in such a global economy that it makes it a little easier to have a soft landing than it was before when we were more isolated. So does that mean that things aren't going to go to hell in a handbasket? Uh, I don't know. I do think the one thing, though, that I always think that Rachel and I believe in is that we are not going to sit here and say, we know what's going to happen and you better put all your money somewhere because, you know, it's the, the doomsday is coming tomorrow. I see that kind of stuff on social media over and over and over. And nobody it's remembers them because they, yeah, but it's scare tags. Nobody remembers them because people say it over and over and over. And it it hasn't happened. Now, mm-hmm. I, you know, I just mentioned Dr. Murphy, you know, Dr. Robert Murphy has been talking about this for, you know, a dozen years. Well, when does it become like white noise where you don't, you know, just kind of tune it out? He would say, well, all they're doing is blowing up the bubble even bigger. So it's going to be a bigger fall. But because we're now in a more modern economic global system, I think that we cannot rely on what we have in the past. Things have changed. Globalization has changed. The, uh, the internet has changed us. The trading systems for the good or better have changed the way we do the algorithms. You know, everybody's talking about a, um, AI now and how it's going to change the financial future. AI has been in algorithms for the stock market for a good 20 years. Um, They've been working on that. Now they just rebranded it and called it AI. Um, Now there's AI is coming into other aspects of our life, but it has been used in that uh, forum. So maybe all that will have some effect on this supposed soft landing. 
Fantastic topics. Bruce, um, we are 15 minutes till the end. Um, how about we try to cover number three and see how far we get? Does that sound good? Okay. All sure. right. So the third myth is that you should use a bank. And I had a, a fun time titling this myth as well. And the reason I would call it a myth that you should use a bank or a lie that you're believing that could be costing you money is that Nelson has used this entire book to uncover the idea that you have the banking system and you have the customer of the bank. And often we are told by our society and the way that that everything operates around us that you should be the customer of the bank. What does that mean? We have our paychecks paid into the bank. We put our money in the bank. We borrow from the bank when we need capital. Now, the bank serves a purpose, right? I mean, Bruce, this is something that we talk about all the time. They wouldn't exist if there wasn't a need for somewhere to house capital and uh, for it to be protected for safekeeping. However, the problem is that when we just look at the ease of transactions and we think about how to make things as simple and easy as possible, usually we can then be doing something for a reason that is benefiting us, but be blind to the way that it is not serving us. And the challenge that Nelson is showing is that if we just use another place to store capital and we put all of our money there, and when we get it back we have to pay to get money back out of it and when we and they and they don't release it quickly and so we have we have to access it through qualifying and applications and we have to prove that we're going to pay money back when you set up an entire system like that the problem is the control of money is in someone else's hands except that's not yours so you have a whole financial system that is benefiting the banking industry much more than it's benefiting you. And the main way that it's doing this is by moving the location of storing capital. If instead the individual stored capital and made a priority to capitalize their own banking system or business that they could put capital into and then be able to take money out of when they needed money, the control would be back in the hands of the person and you wouldn't be paying interest to someone else to use money, you would instead have capital to use. And that's the fundamental or philosophical idea behind the whole idea of becoming your own banker. Because when you store capital, you control capital, now you can reward or earn the rewards of storing and controlling that capital, namely in the form of interest and dividends. And you get all of these benefits by taking over that banking function in your life. So Bruce, there's a lot more that can be said about that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, Nelson, you know, if you ever were um, fortunate enough to see Nelson's two day seminar on the becoming your own banker, uh, he did a, obviously he would have talked about this and he did a whole section on the, the silly idea that people think that a physical bank location is the same as banking. Okay, so you have a physical bank that helps people in the traditional sense that we think of to do banking. And what is that banking? Well, most people see the banking as being transactions, somebody that's facilitating tra transactions. Um, in other words, you know, you write a check, they uh, agree that you have that money in your account and they move it to somebody else's account. That's one banking function. They would say, okay, you're using a credit card. Um, the credit card company, the merchant company sends that money to the, uh, to the bank. And then that bank says, yes, we are going to cover this at an interest rate until this person pays us back over that time period. Mm -hmm. And then they also think about, you know, storing money in there and they think about borrowing money from the bank. And those are all banking functions. However, you could do the same thing. And we are starting to see this with the upcoming blockchain crypto changeover. So one of the greatest benefits of 
cryptocurrency and the blockchain may be even more beneficial is that this can do the same thing as a bank and says, well, here I am my cryptocurrency. The blockchain will verify that you own the cryptocurrency and I will then very quickly be able to transfer that cryptocurrency to the receiver. That is a banking function. Okay. The crypto blockchain can also do lending. Matter of fact, I have crypto right now on a blockchain with a lending institution. So they're paying me on the blockchain in the form of crypto currency to to keep the money there, just like a bank, a physical bank, and they're lending that cryptocurrency to every, everybody else. So they're but they're paying me to actually do it like a savings account. But the great thing here is they cannot fractionally um, increase that. So mm-hmm. they can't do fractional reserve banking. That actually has to be, they can only lend on what they actually have available. And so that is a banking function. Nelson made fun of this because the insurance companies, a lot of people don't know this. When this first came out, Nelson's book, a lot of the insurance companies were nervous because Nelson said, you become your own banker using an insurance contract. So now let's just compare and contrast. And I'll go back to the why the insurance companies were nervous. So he said, now let's just store the money into an insurance company that's stored in there. They're going to give us a rate of return on that, just like you would get an interest rate at the bank. However, this one grows tax-free. The one at the bank doesn't. You can then borrow against your cash value. And Nelson liked that because now you can't do fractional reserve banking. The insurance companies can only lend out against how much money they've actually put into the system. So he liked that as an Austrian, you're not creating money. That's part of the banking function. And then you pay back. Now, the one thing the insurance companies are not set up to do is just to do daily transactions where they, you write a check against your cash value. They're not, that they're not going to do that. I don't believe because that causes extra expenses and they don't want those expenses to go against their dividends. So I don't believe they're going to do that. But what happened was then the insurance industry, um, as Nelson presented this to them and said, hey, I'm going to start teaching this. You guys better be ready because a lot of people are going to become even more interested. They said, oh, well, you can't call it a bank. You can't call this a bank. And you'll see this on all the illustrations that you'll, you'll find from insurance companies, they'll actually say, say something like, this is not a bank. They will actually talk about the interest being paid actually goes to the insurance company, which is true. Now, the reason they put that, because in Nelson's book, he says, why don't you pay interest to yourself? But remember, that was additional interest over what you were paying the insurance company. Mm -hmm. And that additional interest was simply purchasing more PUAs. And the, and the life insurance companies were saying, no, people are going to think that we're not charging them anything. So they got all bent out of shape and they're still kind of, they're still a little bent out of shape and they really want to make their lawyers want to make sure that people know that the insurance company is not a physical bank. But that's okay because now they're all jumping on the bandwagon. They really like it. I shouldn't say all of them, but a lot of them do because they're getting increased premium from this. I mean, it's it's been astronomical. One company we used um, in 2017 had brought in $42 million of premium. And this past year, just six years later, they they're bringing in like $120 million of premium. So they had about a 300% yeah, growth over that time period Mm -hmm. because people are really seeing the benefits of doing the banking function with another entity, which would be a life insurance company. Now, Nelson then says, if that's true, then... That benefit of increasing the premium for the insurance company is just a testament to the fact that more people are recognizing the value of doing this, of using whole life insurance, specially designed whole life insurance for the purpose of banking. Right. And then Nelson, um, 
Nelson would say that um, that is a benefit for everybody in society. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. And then it, it also helps people say, well, who else is doing this? Or why haven't I heard of this? Well, the reason you haven't heard of this is insurance companies do not spend a lot of money on marketing. They rely because they want the dividend. They don't want that extra expense. They want the dividend to be higher. So they rely on agents to actually get the, the message out. So that's, uh, and then Nelson said, if this, all these things are true, which they are, then why wouldn't you want to put all your money into this? <clears throat> now, he also says, and this is the part that a lot of people miss. He says, this can't be done immediately. It will take the average person about 20 years mm -hmm. because insurance companies actually have, they actually have reasons why you can't do this. One is you might reach your human life value. Two is they, they don't want you to put uh, all of your uh, income in this because they want it, you to have some liquidity because there's a loss of liquidity in some of the early years. And the, but you can overcome this by getting your net worth up. So there's two ways that they determine how much premium you can play, pay your, the income you're pr protecting or your net worth. Mm -hmm. So many people do not get their net worth up high enough so that they can put in more premium. So it may not be possible for a lot of people. And there's some uh, restrictions on that. Bruce, I think that we're probably going to have to be wrapping up here at this point today. So we said we're going to cover the top seven money myths that are costing you money. And we have covered the first three. But if we could just recap that point three, <clears throat> the, the myth is that there's one way to do your money. And that way is to use a typical banking system to store your deposits, maybe make it 1% on the money that's in the bank. And then every time you need capital, since you don't really have much, you need to borrow against or borrow from a big institution and get loans and credit cards and lines of credit because the capital is in the ownership of somebody besides you. And Nelson is saying, you can take over the banking function by using another place to store capital that you control. And specifically, he's talking about using an insurance company to do that, where you're storing capital through a whole life insurance policy, building up that cash value and having access to capital up to the amount of your cash value with no questions asked. So I love the idea as well of increasing net worth through assets, which then increases your ability to put more premium dollars into life insurance, which means you have the ability to increase the percentage of your income from work that is going into a life insurance policy. Um, Bruce, we have um, something else here was, we have Lorraine Medspa joining in from Nigeria, learning a lot. So thank you on that. And then um, Fritz, there's a comment that you had said earlier, assets bring money in, liability takes money out. And yes, that's true. I love this definition as well. Assets are what you own, liabilities are what you O, O W E. So that's a very clear distinction um, for assets and liabilities, which those are the two twin components that build into your balance sheet, showing you your net worth, which if you want to increase your net worth, then you increase your assets. Bruce has talked about numerous types of assets that you can use to increase net worth, not just income, but increasing net worth. And then also you have lower liabilities, less things that you owe and either of those things are going to increase your net worth. Yeah, and uh, the, final, the final thing I wanted to talk about today is our relay. Fritz says, the, the first time I got my policy in 2018, I explained to the agent my plan, and she said, well, we are not a bank. And Fritz said, laugh out loud. So another example of the insurance industry wanting to make sure everybody know that they're not a bank. We know you're not a bank. We just want to do the banking function with your institution. Which means controlling capital. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast today. If you're watching live, thank you for joining in. Please go ahead and click the thumbs up on this video if it's been helpful to you today. We love your feedback. 
your comments, your questions. You can subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube. You can also uh, comment during the show, or even if you're watching later, go ahead and put your questions, your comments in. Let us know what you loved about this show and let us know what questions you still have about money myths, lies that are costing you money, infinite banking, or anything to do with taking more control of your financial life. Now, if you have specific questions and you're ready to make a change in your specific financial life, you can do that by going to themoneyadvantage.com and book a conversation. This is a an opportunity really for you to talk with an advisor about your specific goals, your financial life, where your money is, what you're happy with, what you're not happy with, and what you want to do differently so that you can improve and optimize your financial life. And we would love to be able to be a part of that process and really helping you to think differently about money, but also make sure that you're doing the best with what you have so that you can make the most of it today and in the future. So go to themoneyadvantage.com. We would love to have that conversation with you. And in closing, please remember, success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd, and build a life and business you love. We'll see you next time.